Nash, it's really great to have you here, and uh, I just got to say thanks for coming in today. And uh, I got to tell you, it's um, for uh, actually I, you don't know any. I, you're you're actually a big musical inspiration to me. The first time I, I heard about you, I was in high school playing in a band, and uh, somehow after the practice, we were trying. We tuned in TV Ontario. This is about 1976 or something like that. 78. Was it 78? Yeah. And. Wow. Um, and it was uh, what was it? Night music or something like That's that. That's right, yeah. And and, uh, and 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 there you were playing the music along with the, the paintings of Robert Vanderhorst even then, right? Right, yeah. And uh, I just uh, and we were we didn't have cable, so it was really fuzzy picture. I was a fair distance away from Toronto, but uh, the but the feeling that 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 was evoked in me from from the combination of, of your music and the, the paintings was just incredible. So I still get that feeling today when I watch that, that DVD. What, like, um, can you give us maybe the story about how you got to that point? Because obviously at, at that point, to, to get on TVO in those days, you had, you know, what, how did you get to that point at that time? Well, I was uh, known in the community as, as a multimedia artist. I'm not just a musician and composer, and I'm very into visual arts, silent films, and things like that. Rob Vanderhorst, who's a surrealist uh, painter in Toronto, he's an old high school friend of mine. And uh, when I was asked to do night music, and by the way, that first show of night music was all uh, performed entirely live in real time. Um, I was also the only artist asked to come back and do a second night music. So I did the very final night music program about a year and a half later after the first one. But um, they knew of my reputation and they, and they said, oh, we'd love you to come in and do a presentation, music with visuals. So I had, uh, so Rob and I, Rob brought in the, um, his paintings. We set them up on easels and with two floor cameras, um, did these interesting dissolves and pans across mm -hmm. the paintings mm -hmm. while I played the music uh, uh, along with them. So it was, um, that was people's first exposure to me. But after that, I then ex started to expand on my other musical output, which is doing rock and roll tunes mm -hmm. and playing um, some rather thrashy kind of music. So um, I remember once the London Times referred to my music as punk classical. And I quite like that definition. Mm -hmm. Of course, your main instruments are uh, the electric violin and the mandolin, and of course, keyboards as well. Uh, uh, and uh, um, w did you, you know, were those the instruments you learned to play as a kid? Like, did they stick you into violin lessons, like yeah. grade five or something? Yeah, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> I know, I know it's funny because, uh, well, my family, my mother is very musical, and, and so my brother and I took up, uh, he played cello and I played violin. We both went to the Royal Conservatory, and um, I, I quite enjoyed playing violin. I, I was pretty good at it, I guess. And, uh, but the minute I could start to get, uh, when I discovered a pickup, for a violin. I mean, everything's electric guitars, you know, all these devices, amplifiers and foot pedals, they're all made for guitars. And I, uh, I discovered, because I was into jazz violin as well, and I discovered this guy named Joe Venuti, who was an American jazz violinist, and uh, I met him. I met him at a club and saw him perform in Toronto. And he, uh, he had this very interesting pickup on his violin. And um, so I went out and got one or had found similar type of thing and once I got that thing amplified I was in heaven because mm -hmm. I would I you know how kids would be in their basement playing along to their favorite rock bands well I'd be playing violin along to Cream and Hendrix and stuff like that cool so uh, then uh, now you're I, as far as I know correct me if I'm wrong I could be wrong about this but the first couple of albums that you put out Bedside Companion and uh, Dreams and Nightmares That's I guess right, they yeah. were uh, and I under, and I remember from the night music episode that you were playing along with uh, TAC 3440. Mm -hmm. Now, did you record those first two albums on on the 3440? I recorded the first two albums on a four-track tape recorder in my bedroom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, um, what like? Uh, uh, okay, I got to tell you. So after I saw that, I had to do the same thing, and I went out and got a. a <laughs> TX 2440 SX, which was the the cheaper version, right? 
um, and I did a lot of recording uh, as a result uh, using the four track. But what you, I mean, what uh, what's the story of how you got that thirty four forty? Because my story is I saw you on night music, and then I went out and, and got one with all every dollar I earned from my summer job. What was <laughs> you know how did you get to your thirty four forty? Well, I I had a, a mentor, a very special person who helped me in my early part of my career. His name was David Pritchard. And David was on Chum FM. And Chum FM was a radio station. And David had the late night show. He would uh, play music from 2 to 6 in the morning. And David was incredibly eclectic, a very knowledgeable musical person. And he also had his own studio. And he liked to make his own little funny recordings. So David inspired me to, he, he was the one who directed me to get a four track. and and um, the whole use of a four track um, was a little more complicated than today's digital recording because you really needed two machines. You had a four track and a two track because what you would do is the four track is record four tracks of music, bounce it down to two tracks onto the two track, then take the two track tape, put it back onto the four track machine. Now you had two tracks left over. Mm -hmm. So you're essentially doing six tracks. Yep. And um, I like to think of myself as the Phil Spector of electric violin, <laughs> you know, creating a wall of sound out of next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you got to worry about that generation loss every time you uh, well, bounce it. Well, that's right? yeah. You're referring to tape speed, and that yeah. was the trick. Mm -hmm. um, you would record the um, the tracks as, as fast a speed on the tape as possible to keep the uh, tape hiss down. But I found that. Um, Again, my friend uh, David taught me a lot of techniques, and one of the things was saturation, getting the levels good and hot yeah. on it. And um, with my stuff, I mean, there's a lot of um, distortion and effects going on with the pedals and things like mm -hmm. that. So the violin isn't just a pure, sweet instrument. And um, with all those sound effects and stuff, you can sort of cover up the hiss. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Were you concerned that uh, that that the 3440 wasn't going to be enough of a machine to give you kind of professional quality audio, or did you just say, what the heck, I'm just going to do it? No, I, I, I just said, what the heck, because I always went by the sort of premise that I'm not a pop band. I'm not making music for commercial radio. Therefore, production values are arbitrary. Mm -hmm. They're not meant to be ignored, but at the same time, I, I had certain sort of ideas of what sounded good. And uh, interestingly enough, I'm just reissuing my, uh, those, those records on CD and remastered them just literally a week ago. And they sound phenomenal. They sound mm -hmm. better than they sounded on vinyl. Mm -hmm. Everything's been bumped up with today's modern digital mastering techniques. So um, I'm not ashamed of my production values. And they stand up tremendously. So you're able to r enhance them from the originals up to modern standards using new te new technology yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, digital uh, mastering techniques, yeah. Okay. So now uh, also y uh, you were uh, founded the band or co-founded the band FM yeah. in what, 1976? 76, yeah. The interesting thing about that is I didn't hear about FM until after I already had your first two albums, I think. And then mm -hmm. FM came out with their... Um, Black Noise album. Yeah. Uh, Can you, do you want to tell the story about FM? Well, um, FM started as uh, two of us, myself and Cameron Hawkins, the keyboard player. We um, we started as sort of an extension of my solo uh, performing, and I used a drum machine. And so there were there was myself and Cameron, and like I said, he was on keyboards, I was violin, and mandolin, and drum machine, and. Um, we did a few gigs together, just the two of us. A uh, very famous gig at a place called A Space in Toronto. And was that uh, at 183 Bathurst Street? No, A Space was right downtown on St. Joseph Street. Okay. You're young and blur. And um, but a year later, let's see, Cameron and I formed in 76. In 77, uh, we got together with the drummer Martin Deller, and so that became the trio known as FM. Mm -hmm. And we recorded the Black Noise album mm -hmm. in '77. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and was that after the fir your first two solo? No, albums? it was before. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I went. Uh, I formed FM. Then I left FM. Then we reformed FM. Then I went solo again. So okay. that's over about 20 years period. 
All right. Okay. So what are you doing now? What am I doing now? Yeah. Oh, I'm solo. You're flying solo <laughs> again? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm flying solo again. Good, great pilot. <laughs> never never again going back to bands, no. You did a, a show a couple years ago at the uh, St. Lawrence Hall. That's right. right. Yeah. And it was a red carpet affair, and I didn't know it was a red carpet affair. I, I knew that you were playing there. Actually, Rex Chainbelt. I don't, you know, I don't know if you know Rex, but um, he told me about it, and uh, I went down there with my friend Daryl. <laughs> and and we, other somehow Darryl? we talked our way in to the <laughs> event, and it oh. was an invitation-only event. But uh, somehow we got in and had a great time, and uh, got to see the performance. There was fabulous food, free drinks, and uh, the paintings of Robert Vanderhorst. It was r r fantastic time, I got to say. And then on my way out. The, uh, the people there chased me out and said, here, take a gift bag. <laughs> and it's got this fabulous DVD in it. Excellent. And that's what we're playing right now. And, um, and again, it creates that feeling uh, wh when you watch that DVD of the paintings juxtaposed with the music. And it's really... Uh, what's, uh, and you guys go by the, uh, when you work together, by the name of two artists? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that project? Well, Ro Rob and I, like I said, or you discuss, we both discussed that we had done our first sort of public presentation on TV Ontario years before. And so about um, six years ago, I guess it is now, we decided to do it up properly. Because again, the TV show, as I said, he had brought in the paintings and we had simply filmed it live with floor cameras. So we decided we were going to do View from the Gallery uh, as a presentation of all of Wob's work up to that point. And we selected the paintings and then we had them all scanned, high resolution scanning, and then into the computer and then did the, the whole sort of visual pass, whether it be dissolving in and out or panning across, and created these uh, environments and, and bring the viewer through the paintings. Mm -hmm. Rob paints the paintings and then I write the music for the paintings, and then I tell Rob what the story is. <laughs> the story that is the painting and the music combined? Yeah. I, I, I'm the guy who creates the map. Mm -hmm. So once I've done the music, I then say, okay, Rob, here's where I think it should go. Here's what I think it's about and what we want to take the viewer through. So in some ways, I'm kind of like the director. And, but I have a very specific idea because it's how I've interpreted the painting through the music. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to start the music with some very pastoral sounds, my mind and eye is thinking about one little part of that painting. And because they're surrealist paintings, they have a lot of characteristics to them, very mm -hmm. strange mm -hmm. details. Mm -hmm. So we take the viewer through the painting, and the journey is, is sort of, you're creating an ambience with the music, and the viewer mm -hmm. then gets the experience. Mm -hmm. And, and when you're doing it, I guess you can, you, you, as you say, you start with a detail of the painting, and then, and, and you can see that when you see where the camera goes through on the, as the music yep. goes, you, you pan out and you see different parts of the painting. And uh, it was uh, kind of uh, interesting uh, there, was, everybody was engaged in the game of finding the Lancaster bomber in the painting. Yeah. Because. The Lancaster cause, bomber? Yeah, because don't, where? is it? Almost it's a B, all his it's paintings. It's a B fifty two. Have is it? Yeah. Is it a B fifty two? Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, but in almost all, all the all, paintings. All of his paintings have a B fifty two. Yeah. It? There's a secret plane in the yeah. paintings. Yeah. Every one of them could be. There's this one painting. It's not in this first version. We did a we did a second DVD view from the gallery volume two, and in the painting there's a painting that's actually called View from the Gallery, and in the painting of View from the Gallery, is it's if you can imagine looking from the perspective you're looking through a series of rooms and you can see there are paintings on the walls in the background mm -hmm. there are people standing looking at the paintings in the foreground is this little black cat the cat would be about the size of your thumbnail <laughs> around the cat's neck is a collar on the collar is a b-52 painting imagine how small that is so you'd really have to have like a magnifying glass to find the. You have to have a magnifying glass so to it's paint worse the than, darn thing. Let alone yeah, and, see and it. it's worse than finding Waldo. And oh, it's all the exactly like finding Waldo. And, yeah, because it's really small. That's, so, but that's an example where what Rob does with the, the bomber. You never know where it's going to be.
Boom. And, and I, I was looking at those uh, paintings, and a lot of the houses that he paints are very English. They certainly have a lot of English flavor to In them. In that one particular painting. A yeah. And I was thinking maybe, you know, the music and the uh, paintings is what resonates with the English people. Well, this comes after the fact of my being in England. I, I was uh, touring in England years ago, and um, but yes, this is this is uh, the British certainly like this uh, presentation. Yeah. All right. So uh, now we've got. Uh, well, Stella asks you what you're up to these days, and there's a show coming up at the Blue Moon, which right, is yes. uh, in in my neighborhood, which uh, I'm really looking forward to. Broadview and Queen, East End of Toronto. You can and, just walk uh, there, right? This is, uh, a, I, I, it's also in my neighborhood, I'm right there, and uh, the Blue Moon is just uh, sort of a new discovery on my part. I know, I've known the bar for a long time, but uh, this will be the first time I've performed there, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's uh, going to be well attended. I haven't played live in Toronto in over two years, so, even though I'm from here, but I've been out and about and busy and doing other things, so. Now, what, what can people expect? Uh, when, is it this Saturday? This is, yeah, this is this Saturday, and um, it's uh, the rock show. It's, uh, I, I define my, my sets, my live performing. I have over five and a half hours of live music, and I have what I define as the arts, the art music, an art show, which would be doing a view from the gallery. Um, I also have three silent movies I've done scores for. And then there's the rock show. So this is going to be one of the rock shows. And it's basically going to be biting the heads off of whippets kind of thing. Well, that sounds like fun. Um, are you going to have a full band there, like drums? Oh, no. And, uh, oh, no. Or is it no, just no, you? No, no, no. It's always like just solo. Just, okay. Yeah. There's enough room on stage for me and a band. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, that's going to be great. Now, what to, uh, if people want to go, I mean, how much are the tickets? And, it's $10 to uh, get in. Yeah. Uh, there's no advanced tickets, so uh, there'll probably be a lineup. So I recommend people get there at 10 o'clock or so to uh, catch the show. And are you working on any new uh, recordings or new music? Well, I just mentioned that uh, I reissued my first two albums on CD. Um, it's called Blind Windows. And then also in a two months' time, I'm putting out a compilation of all my uh, solo work. There will be no cover songs. And sort of like the best of over 30 years, and it's called The Reckless Use of Electricity. Mm. Hmm. How apropos. I think so. <laughs> well, isn't it? Absolutely. So uh, that's fantastic. Now, we didn't really get a chance to talk about, uh, you know, the... the Roadkill, the uh, Bruce oh, McDonald yeah, film yeah. that you were in, um, or, uh, or, or much else. But is there anything that maybe we missed that we should let people know about that Nash? No, we covered a lot. Uh, what the heck, I'll just come back some other time. And uh, I'll, get, I'll make sure to get the bandages out of the dry cleaners that time. Too. Well, okay. Well, that'd be fa <laughs> you know, it'd be great if we, I don't know if you want to perform here, but that would be uh, awesome. Do you do that? Sure. Yeah, we do. I can do it in here in a... Flash. So we've got a big green screen. We can do all kinds of stuff. We can project. Oh, no, no. Roberts I could bring paintings. in projectors. And yeah. we, you could put white cloth there instead of green. And I could make this entire room psychedelic like you wouldn't believe. That, really? That, that Piece sounds... of cake. Okay. Well, That would be excellent. That would be really cool. So uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll yeah. work on that. Excellent. Anyway, a great pleasure to meet you and, uh, and to have this here. discussion today. So thanks so much, NashTheSlash. And I guess people, if they want to check you out, NashTheSlash.com. That's right.